This is a man who knows the power of silence. One day in 1973, he decided to stop speaking. His vow of silence continued for 17 years. That is, until he decided to share his wisdom with us all. I had a responsibility to more than just me. And that I was going to have to change. You know, we can do it. I was going to have to change. John Francis is an environmentalist and activist. They call him the Planet Walker. This is the inner view. And the Planet Walker himself joins us now on the interview. John Francis, I thank you very much for joining us. Really looking forward to this. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So good to see you, Amron. So 17 years without speaking a word, walking the earth, not using motorized transportation. Tell me about the moment you decided to do that. Well, um, the, the, the moment happened when I, I saw an oil spill in San Francisco Bay in 1971. And I wanted to do something, but I, I wasn't sure what it was I could do to address the nearly million gallons of oil that spilled on, in the bay and washed up on the shore. Um, Cleaning didn't seem to be enough. And so I decided that what I was going to do was I was going to stop using motorized vehicles. And so um, I started walking. Um, I started walking and my friends and neighbors uh, looked at me in shock and they said, you know, uh, why have you given up riding in cars? I said, because of the oil. And we argued about it for many, many days and weeks. And eventually on my uh, 27th birthday, I, I was so tired of arguing, I decided that I, I would stop speaking for one day. Hmm. And I, I gave up speaking for that one day and realized that I had not been listening. Um, I would listen just enough to think I knew what someone was going to say. I would stop listening and start thinking about what I was going to say back. And uh, I realized that uh, I had really stopped communicating because the greater part of communication or an equal part of communication is listening. And um, so after that day, I realized I was going to be silent for another day. And it took me about a, a week of being silent before I realized I was going to not speak for a year. And, and then I would revisit that decision of not speaking for a year and see where, if it was still appropriate, uh, I would continue. If not, um, I would end my silence. I appreciate the fact that you do speak these days, otherwise we wouldn't have a program unfortunately. Um, um, at first, superficial glance, when you have somebody who witnesses something terrible, whether an atrocity or uh, an environmental disaster, which is no doubt caused by the actions of men, when you have somebody who, who witnesses that and says, I'm out, I'm, I'm going to be quiet, I'm not going to engage in the metrics of this world. I'm not going to use uh, mechanized or motorized transportation or contribute to the oil industry and so on. It's, it, it sounds like somebody who's done with the world and wants to recoil from it, not somebody who wants to make a difference necessarily in the world. So tell me how your walking and your silence formulated your thoughts in terms of how you were going to make a difference? Did you, did you see yourself as being a moral symbol of something, and was that going to be it? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And, and you know, really, when I stopped riding in cars, I guess all I, all I thought about was that, well, you know, we're using too much oil. I'm going to try to live a lifestyle a little more harmoniously with the environment and um, using less oil. And, and that was my, my idea. Um, and, and I still did the things that, you know, or tried to do those things that I did when um, I did ride in cars. I tried to, to go visit my friends and, and do the shopping. I had to continue living life. I realized it was a, a lot different than when I did ride in cars and things started to shrink. And um, I started to be in the place where I was and I started to, um, you know, feel like I was part of the, the rest of the planet because not everybody gets to drive around in motorized vehicles on the world. Uh, when I stopped speaking, that was probably the, the biggest change because um, while I still wanted to be part of the world, the part of the world that I wanted to be part of was uh, not so much giving my ideas and, and saying what I thought, but really wanting to hear what other people thought and to listen not only to people, but to the environment. And that's what changed me. That's what really um, made me feel like I was engaged maybe for the first time in my life in what life was really about and really about making a difference. And uh, I went on that journey uh, not knowing uh, what I was going to become or who I was going to become, but realizing that the person that I had been um, maybe wasn't fully engaged. What did the environment tell you as you listened to it? Well, you know, um, listening to like just being part of uh, the natural environment for me was just a huge, um, amazing thing. I would walk, uh, spending my time walking in wild areas and wilderness areas and uh, being with uh, nature and hearing natural sounds and not so much the man-made sounds. And I think that was healing for me. Um, that I could listen to water and hear the voices in the water. I could be in the night, I could be in the darkness and not be afraid where I, I usually was very afraid as a, as a young person. Um, I didn't wanna be alone and being alone um, with myself, uh, I was rediscovering maybe who I was or who I was becoming for the first time. And, uh, and when I was alone, I realized that I didn't know everything. As I listened, I listened to, to people. I realized I needed to go to school. <laughs> and so I did go to university. I made that part of my journey. And as you studied, got these multiple degrees, became more invested as an environmentalist, and I guess developed more tools and got some academic rigor you had the soul and the spirit already, and you, you added knowledge to it, right? You added knowledge of the world, knowledge of how, how systems worked, playing your banjo, doing your thing. Tell me about some of the challenges you might have had over, over those years, given that throughout all of this, you were still not speaking at all. Yeah, I, it, it's, it was a, an amazing journey. And um, one of the things besides playing um, the banjo that I did, which I helped, helped me communicate, was that I kept a journal, uh, a painting journal of watercolors, and also a journal that I wrote my thoughts in and my experiences in. And I would revisit those uh, from time to time. Uh, when I went to university, um, I did learn um, the, you know, what had come before me. There were many people who had studied the environment before me. And so I learned a lot about uh, what people had thought and what people had written. 
uh, what people had painted when their environmental painters uh, and artists who had come before me uh, that helped me understand my place uh, in the environment and how um, things have changed for me, things that like uh, that I think uh, we need to go the direction I'd like to see us go when we talk about environment. Hmm. Uh, hmm. I think the probably the biggest thing for me, after walking across the the United States, North America, and and studying at university, um, was that when I got to the uh, east coast of uh, North America and I realized I, I was going to start talking again. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to say, but my feeling about the environment had changed from being just about pollution and, and uh, loss of species and habitat and climate change and those very important things to really include people. Because if people were part of the environment, then our first opportunity to treat the environment in a sustainable way, or, or even to understand what we mean by sustainability, mm. was to, to say that how we treated each other, <laughs> how we treated each other was really the foundation of environmentalism. And so environment for me became about human rights and civil rights and gender equality and economic equity and all the ways that human beings relate and treat one another. And how are we doing when you compare now to, to when you embarked on your journey? How are we doing in the environment, in human rights, in equality, in war? What do you think? Well, you know, I think that one thing, we've really uh, come a long way in our consciousness about uh, the environment, that it's important, that it's something that we should think about. Now, um, if I look at how we're treating each other, uh, I think there's a great number of people in the world, and, and you, can't, you can't dismiss the people that we don't hear about that are treating each other in the, just the most marvelous way, and each individual treating other individuals in, in really kind ways. But, you know, when I look at the world and, and I, you know, have to look at all of the things that are happening on the planet, there are places where I'm thinking that we're not doing so well. We're, and, and it's, you know, we're, we're at war with each other. And, and I think that needs to change. I believe that kindness is something that we really need to, to uh, exercise and work on. Uh, I, I just wrote a book, finished writing a book on kindness, a children's book, because uh, you know we have to begin with our future and, and the children are our future. And it's you know human kindness, true stories of generosity and compassion that have changed the world. And really, there are so many examples of kindness in the, in, in the planet that there's so much for us to learn about how to be kind to each other. And I believe that that kindness that individuals have for each other can spread to governments, mm. communities, mm. governments, and all of us. And, and I think that's something that we need to think about and not only think about, not only hope for, but to act on it. And each individual person, each individual person in the world can act on it with their family, with the people around them. And as we do that, it changes the world. Mm. Writing a children's book. Um, Chief Seattle said we don't inherit the world from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And it, it you know, I'm reminded of that when, when you say that you, you, you want to inspire children. When you talk of kindness and this bubbling up, and maybe it can even change governments, the reality as things stand is that you have a lot of people, very pure souls, such as yourself, with a lot of empathy, compassion, love, who 
are doing good work, but don't really wield massive power. But the people that are wielding massive power with nuclear weapons and, and militaries and mega uh, trillion dollar companies tend to be narcissists and psychopaths, sociopaths, uh, waging wars, getting people addicted uh, to their products, dividing people. Do you sometimes feel frustrated that it's even though one by one by one you're trying to make a difference, that ultimately you're, you're up against this massive leviathan? Well, um, I'm not sure it's more frustration or it is um, sadness for people who are where they are and they're not in a really good place and that they're suffering. So I, I do feel this empathy for um, all of us who are suffering. And at the same time, I believe that the, I mean, being on this program, for example, is, is a way to spread that uh, message of kindness and that uh, it does make a difference when we are kind to each other. And yes, I know that there are governments and corporations and uh, economies that um, think of people as externalities. And I'm hopeful in my actions of being kind that uh, the children who uh, are part of our world now will be in those places and that the kindness that they have learned about and the kindness that they uh, are experience and are acting uh, as will, will make a difference in even the most uh, dictatorial um, and unchanging governments and economies. Do you get involved in politics at all? Do you ever tell people, I don't know, who you voted for or who they should vote for, where you stand on political issues? Do you feel the need to wade into those things or not? Well, you know, in, in my, my, own, uh, my own community, um, I, I do. You know, I'm, I'm a political person. I don't say I'm not, I vote. Um, what, but when I vote uh, and in my political, I guess, uh, policy is that I can live with everybody and I want to live with everyone and I want to listen to everyone and I want to understand where uh, each person is coming from and then maybe uh, they can understand where I'm coming from and maybe we can compromise and maybe we can live together because uh, I think uh, we all have to live on the planet and I think wherever the planet goes, we're all going to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wherever the environment goes, we're all going to be affected by it. So uh, the idea is not to just be um, sectarian half of to be half of one group of people and the other half. No, it's all of us. And if all of us aren't going to be, um, I guess all of us are not going to be saved on the planet, then none of us are going to be huh. saved. So I'm looking for the solution or the the road or the the path. And, and since I'm a walker, I'm a big uh, you know, opponent, not opponent, but proponent of, of following a path yeah. uh, is yeah. that for all of us. And so my saying is, you know, as, as we aspire, and I'm thinking of as, as all of us, as all the planet, as all people aspire, so we shall become. And I feel that that's exactly what's happening as we aspire we shall become. And so as, as a planet, as a people, uh, to aspire for the, the most amazing future, for the most amazing present for all of us, all of us, as we aspire, we shall become. Mm. 
you are a talker these days, so you're no longer <laughs> silent, but as you mentioned, you're still a walker, and it's very admirable. You're in your 70s now, and you're still walking. You're doing trips all over the world. I understand that you were in my home country, South Africa, as well. Tell me more about your walking and your listening and what you're still learning at this stage of your life, at this point in your life where you're, you're different to the, the John of 1971. Tell me about what's going on while you're walking. Well, um, it's very interesting. I uh, am returning to South Africa. Uh, to uh, Cape Town, and where I started uh, last uh, February walking, um, I spent the whole month of February walking from Cape Point uh, into Cape Town uh, to Gordon's Bay, mm -hmm. and I return uh, this January, so next year I return for two months of walking from Gordon's Bay north uh, through uh, uh, through South South Africa, uh, North, hopefully at some point in the next several years, I will get to Cairo. Wow. <laughs> well, you're not going diff... to walk all the way to Cairo, right? Just to be that, just to be absolutely that... clear. <laughs> I mean, I know you're a fit guy, and you you know you you have a lot of self belief, but it might be tough. <laughs> It might be tough, and I, I, I understand that. <laughs> but, you know, you have to take one step at a time uh, right. okay. and one day at a time. But you can dream. Mm. But in order to dream, you can hope. But in order to hope, let's act on those hopes. Let's act on those dreams. So my journey, my walk is a metaphor for the journey that we're all on. It's dedicated to children. Mm of the world, children all over the world. It's dedicated to kindness and children all over the world. And uh, as part of that, it's, I'm not the, the John Francis who would just put my backpack on and grab my banjo and, and, and go running off you know, down the road. And when I got tired, I would put down a sleeping bag and, and I would sleep. And if it rained, I might sleep under a bridge or put up my tent. I'm not that guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I can do that. I guess it, the part of me, um, and that's why I accept a, a team. I have a team of people who are now working with me in South Africa, and I'm working uh, with the GLOBE program, which is a, an environmental education program. Uh, all over the world. It's about 157 countries and maybe 50,000 schools where uh, the children will be following me, students will be following me on the internet and other, other ways through podcasts that we'll be having. And we'll be collecting scientific data that uh, will help our scientists uh, look at solutions of climate change, um, looking at uh, mosquito habitats and cloud cover and all those things, but also collecting stories uh, from uh, children from different parts of the, of, of the world. Now, I'll be in, walking in South Africa, but I will be visiting um, all the countries in Africa Beautiful. that are globe countries for sure, and uh, starting walks with children there because you know, if if I don't make it, <laughs> if I don't make it, Eamon, I'm hoping that the children will. Oh, well, you're going to make it. Um, <laughs> very, very finely. I mean, some of us might not have the chance to, to, to dive into silence for 17 years. But very briefly, if you can, tell us in a sentence what the power of silence is. Wow, that's, that's such a, you know. <laughs> I, are you, you going to be silent for 17 years after this? 
I think you're going back into your shell again. Yeah. What yeah. is the power of <laughs> silence? <laughs> you thought I was going to keep quiet. There yeah, yeah, way. okay. <laughs> and 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 it, you know, it's. I wish I could tell you in one sentence that. Uh, what you could discover in 17 years. <laughs> but what I will say is if you are silent, you will learn to listen. And what you might hear may surprise you. Mm. Beautiful. John Francis, an absolute honor talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us on the interview. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.